Amen. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Proverbs chapter 3 tonight. Proverbs chapter 3. I wanted to kind of keep with the theme of today. <clears throat> and I had an entirely different message to preach. And uh, the Lord spoke to my heart uh, about pulling a, a message way back in my history of preaching. Matter of fact, it goes so far back, this is the first sermon I ever preached. Um, I pulled it back, and matter of fact, it is, I didn't have a computer when I first started preaching. Here's my notes. I, I had to look through that for a little bit and I had to maybe get a, some hieroglyphic definitions because I, I just can't write worth a flip. Uh, but uh, I was looking through there and it's just I don't know why that came to me, but I was sitting there studying on my sermons and the and, uh, Lord said, hey, pull this one out, pull this one out. And uh, I want to be a help to you and maybe encourage you tonight. And I know all of us need to be reminded uh, where to put our trust. Uh, in this life the Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 you can probably quote it without your Bible but if you have your copy of the word of God and you can follow along with us right there Proverbs 3 verse 5 the Bible says trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path this chapter actually I'm telling you this, this is probably one of the greatest chapters in Proverbs talking about the will of God as we talked about this morning. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit, but since we expounded on that this morning, we won't be there very long. But this verse is a life verse to many people. A lot of people, you ask them what their life verse is, they'll tell you three, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 uh, as their life verse. And, and rightfully so, it's a great verse, a great passage of Scripture. Uh, it's guided my thinking for several years. Matter of fact, it was probably one of the first verses that really meant a lot to me, and that's why I preached it as my first sermon uh, when I was a 17 or 18 year old, and uh, it meant a lot to me then. And uh, you know, as we go through life, uh, life is a very, it's kind of a bumpy road, isn't it? Uh, we live in this world, and if you've lived in this world any length of time, you know that living the life is very bumpy. Uh, there's a lot of curbs in the road. There's a lot of pitfalls, pitholes on the road of life. A lot of troubles come our way. A lot of situations occur in our life. A lot of things that we think are going to happen never happen. A lot of things that maybe we hope for, we kind of get our hopes down and it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, we know what it is. It's, it's called life. Uh, we know what it's like to live this life and to see the suffering and the pain and the agony and the other things that we go through each and every day. Now, I'm not trying to be humdrum here because there's certainly some pleasant things in life. Uh, the Lord has been all good to us in some way, shape, or form or fashion and we can hold a testimony service tonight on just merely the goodness of God in our life. So I do not deny that God is good. Uh, this verse, if it teaches us anything, is that God is good in such a way that He wants us to trust Him for everything we need and everything we go through. And I, I thought about the power of this verse and what it means and, and the idea uh, of the, the concept of this verse. What is God trying to say to us? Over and over and over and over and over and over in Scripture, God reiterates to us to trust Him. He wants us to put Him to the test. He wants us to lean ourselves upon Him. Matter of fact, He tells us in the verse not to lean into our own understanding because I have found in my life when I begin to lean to my own understanding, I begin to lose my mind. You know, when we begin to look at on how things are going to get done on our measure and who we are, we're going to worry because we're not God. You see, God is able to do the impossible in our life. God is able to do things that, that we would never even dream to be able to do in our life. That's why we need Him uh, in our life. Uh, he, can, he, can do, he can move mountains to where we can't move those mountains, but God can. And so it's important that we live a life of faith. We live a life of trusting Him no matter what part of the journey of life you're on, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a young adult, whether you're an adult, whether you're a senior in here, it doesn't matter. Uh, we need to learn this lesson that God's trying to teach us in His Word, and that is simply to trust in Him. 
God wants us to put full faith in His ability to take care of us. And over and over again in Scripture we see that. And I just want to take a little trip through Scripture tonight and maybe help encourage you on this fact of God wanting us to trust in Him. Let's pray and ask God to bless us. Father, I pray that You'd move upon the service tonight. I pray, Father, that You would, uh, Lord, just fill this place with Your presence in such a way that folks would be able to be spoken to, Father. I pray that you'd go in and out of pews and you would grab a hold of hearts as only you can. And so, Father, I pray you'd help us to lean upon you and not upon ourselves. And Lord, we'll thank you for that. In your precious and holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. I want to share with you tonight five things that we need to give trust in to God. There's some things in our life I believe God wants us to, to allow us to trust Him completely in. Now, I didn't take a survey. I didn't take an interview of who's going through what tonight. I don't know uh, many of the personal details in your life. Only you know this. So this is the Holy Spirit speaking if something hits you right square in the face. Uh, if you're like me, uh, most of these things have hit me in my life sometime or another. And I have seen God to be faithful. And there's five things here. Again, I want to springboard from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 because the generalization here is simply this. God says, trust me. That is the general idea of the sermon tonight. The general idea from this passage, God just wants us to trust Him and not lean upon our own selves. He says, don't lean on your understanding. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your paths. You know, the scary thing about life is sometimes worrying about the future, is it not? Very scary to think about what's going to happen tomorrow or next week. Sometimes you might get afraid when you think about, well, how is this going to transpose in my life? How is this going to fall out? How is this going to unfold? And we think about these things and only to find out we get to tomorrow and God takes care of it, does He not? You know, let's be honest. Over half the things we worry about never come, come to place, do they not? I would have to say that's true in my life. Uh, over half the things that I worry about hardly ever come true. Now, that doesn't mean every time I worry about something that doesn't come true, but over half the time, those things don't come to pass. And I find that when I get into tomorrow that I was worried so much about, God has tomorrow in the palm of His hand. And because of that, I can trust Him for the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. You see, living for God is a day-by-day -day process. It's not one of these things, and it's kind of touched on this morning's sermon. God wants us to live for Him day-by-day. Day. He doesn't want us to, to draw out this. Now again, God does tell us to plan in His Word and be planners and be organized. I, I certainly believe in those things. But when it comes to worry and it comes to our future, God says, I want you to live for me today and not worry about what's on tomorrow. He tells us that in Matthew chapter 6, not to worry about tomorrow. I've discovered in my life over and over and again there's no need to worry about tomorrow because God already has it in His hand. So over again, Scripture tells us to trust in Him, trust in Him. What are these five things? Well, God wants us first of all to trust Him in a time of affliction and trouble. We face troubles, we face trials, we, ta we face tribulations. God wants us to trust Him in the bad times. Let me tell you, sometimes God sends the bad times along so that we would trust Him more. Y'all believe that? I believe that. I believe sometimes we go through the things we go through just simply for God to allow us to trust Him more. And I'm telling you, I know without a fact there's things that have been dropped in me and my wife's lap in our lives that God has just simply placed there no more than just to allow us to trust Him. I mean, even recently... We, we've had things happen and we thank the Lord going through rough times and, and you, you hear uh, the, the individual say you know it's going to cost this and this and this and this and this y'all know how it is you know and you're thinking how in the world am I going to do this you know how in the world can we do this only to find out a couple of weeks ago where Tommy knows about it because we didn't think it belonged to us. We did some research and we found out it did belong to us. We got a check in the mail from the United States Treasury. And I'm thinking, where did this come from? It come from like a year and a half ago, two years ago. You know, God knew about that. 
You know, God took care of us. And it more than covered everything we needed. And I thank the Lord for, for doing that. But, but this is a lesson because here we are. Here I was, my wife not so much, but I'm the worry ward of the family. And, you know, I'm worried to death about how things are going to be done. I'm worried to death about how we're going to move forward. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, I was letting it bother me. Brother Glenn, I let it steal my joy. And, I walk, and you know, it's ironic. I hardly ever check the mail. But do you know the day that I found that check, I checked the mail. <laughs> but you know, hey, it's green, it spins anywhere. But I, I get to the mailbox and it's almost like God says, zing. You know, God says, see, where I guide, I provide. And it brought me back to when I was about to go under, when I was about to go under with worry and stress, and God says, I will take care of you. And that verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, pops in my mind. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. What God's saying is don't worry. Don't worry about how... Look, you, you see what I was doing? I was trying to figure out how I was going to solve that problem on my own. And I use a personal illustration like that because I want you to understand, sometimes as preachers, maybe we get looked at as, as we don't go through the normal life. I'm living the life like you are. And I face things and I go through things just like you do. And understand that God is trying to teach us things sometimes in our life. I was worried to death. My blood pressure probably shot up. I was, I was a nervous wreck, just ask my wife. And then God reminds me, I go to the mailbox, open the mailbox, and there's the check for triple more than what we needed. God says... All that worrying, all that stress for nothing. God taught me a good lesson that day and even allowed me to be the one to open the mailbox that day. Isn't that something? I mean, I, I didn't have a black eye, but God gave me a black eye that day. <laughs> uh, spiritually. He's like, see, told you. The Bible just wants us to know, to trust God in the time of affliction, to trust God in the bad times, to trust God in the valley. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 138 and verse 7, it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Thank God that we do not have a God that forsakes us when we are in trouble. He's better than a brother or a friend. The Bible says there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother and his name is Jesus. I'm so thankful tonight there's nothing that I go through. I don't walk alone. I'm thankful tonight that he knows every single need in your life. And that brings me to number two. Trust him in a time of need. Trust Him in a time of need. Philippians 4.19, this kind of goes hand in hand with my illustration. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What is your problem tonight? What is your need tonight? Is there a, an outstanding bill? Is there some situation that, that is occurring in your family that you don't know how to deal with? I don't know what your need is tonight, but my Bible tells me that God owns the cattle of a thousand hills and He owns the hills as well. The night. Bible tells us He will supply all our need. We tend to look at that verse and think it just talking about money. That is not what it says there. God did not say, I will supply all the money that you need. He said, I will supply all your what? Needs. That's far more than money tonight. God says you can trust me to supply every single thing, every single detail that you need. I'm here tonight to tell you that I have never gone without that which I needed. In my entire life, there's never been a time that I've gone in true need. Now, we as Americans need help defining what a true need is, don't we? We don't know what it's like to really need. But let me tell you, and I've had people tell me, woe is me, woe is me. And I say, you got clothes on your back, check. Do you have food on your table? Check. Do you got gas in the automobile? Check. Can you get to and fro to work? Check. Did God give you the health to do the job that you need to get done? Check. 
And they kind of look at me like, whoa, I see what you're talking about. God has given you everything that you need. Let me tell you, you, there's things that we may want. And, you know, it took me a while to learn that as a teenager into a young adult is there's differences between wants and needs, right? There's differences between wants and needs. But understand tonight, the Bible doesn't say He's going to supply all my wants because there's a thousand things I want, right? There's a thousand things you want. Just go to the mall. You'll find all kinds of things you want. Go to the car lot. You know, we was looking for my sister-in-law. She's looking for a car to drive, something cheap. She's getting ready to get her license, be able to drive. And we went on to the car lot. And Buddy, let me tell you, I can look at that car lot and tell you about four or five things I, I want. Some people might say I need it. You know, something nice and fast and sleek. But you know, that's not a need, that's a want. You know? And the Bible tells us God didn't say He was going to supply our wants. God says, I will supply all of your needs. I'm here to tell you today, I've been saved since I was eight years old. And God has supplied all my needs. There's been, never been a need to what God did not intervene and take care of me. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. And He will direct thy paths. So we trust Him in times of affliction and trouble and stress. We trust Him in times of need. We trust Him to lead us to His perfect will. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We talked about that this morning. I was amazed that I didn't even mention this in my sermon this morning. But this verse goes so well with what was talked about this morning. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it tells us a little bit about God's will and God's path and God's direction. And isn't it amazing? It verifies everything that Jesus said this morning. It says that if we will acknowledge Him, He'll do what? Direct our paths. Man, I'm telling you, I I don't know whether I was just dumb and just didn't catch it, but man, that truth from this morning, it's all over the Bible, is it not? If you'll just apply the word to our life, God will direct our paths. It's right there in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We can trust God for our future. We can trust God for the path that He has for us. Now, you may be here tonight... And you may be 60 or 70 years old. I want you to know something tonight. God has a path for you. God ain't done with you. Your heart's beating. God's got a path. You know, we got this idea that because we get past 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, that, that, that our life is done. And, there, you know, we've accomplished everything we need to do. And we're just here for a ride. No, God has a path for every soul in this room. God has a plan. God has a direction. And God wants you and me to find it today. Again, there's a lot of truth that's hinging on the sermon from this morning. But we need to trust Him to lead us to His perfect will for our lives. We need to trust Him, really, in essence, with our lives. Trust God with who we are in our lives. What else? We're to trust Him for our salvation. Now, you say, preacher, it's Sunday night, corner of the cream of the crop. Why are you talking about salvation? I want to talk about salvation from the standpoint of security. You see, there's a lot of Christians that are here tonight that sometimes you wake up and you don't feel saved. Y'all ever been there? How many of you have ever doubted your salvation? Boy, let me tell you, if there's ever an epidemic in our churches today, it is people who doubt their salvation. Let me tell you something. I've doubted my salvation. I think that it's a part, and there's no, there's really no, when we begin our new convert classes and we open up our new convert material, the very first lesson is on doubting your salvation. Want to know why? Because everybody doubts their salvation. I said it. Everybody doubts their salvation at one point or another. And the Bible tells us God never intends for you and I to doubt our salvation. He intends for us to trust Him with our salvation. So if we can trust Him with our physical needs and our afflictions, we can trust Him with our spiritual needs. How about that? And I've I've helped so many people through the years. I hope I have. I seem to have had. They come to me and say, I doubt my salvation. And I know you can see their life and you see the fruit in their life. And 
they may have made a mistake or two in their life and they just feel like they've struck out on God. And I have them read several passages of Scripture. A lot of times, Romans 10, 13. We preached on that a few weeks ago. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, well, God's promised you salvation. Did you call upon the Lord? Did you repent of your sin? you trust in Christ? Yeah, preacher, I did that. So are you calling God a liar? Well, no, no, I'm not calling God a liar. Well, God says if you trust Him and you call out to Him and you repent of your sin, the Bible says you shall be saved. Somebody help me out. What does shall mean? Now, if God promises you something, do you think He's going to keep His end of the bargain? Absolutely. And there's a lot of people tonight that are not able to do great things for God. It's because they're still back on first base doubting their salvation. If God says He saved you, He saved you. Amen? Now maybe you're here tonight and you don't feel like that ever happened. Tonight's the great night to give your heart and life over to Christ. And you can know that you know that you know before you lay your head on the pillow tonight. Now I'm, I'm sitting here to tell you tonight, there's some of you maybe sitting here, you don't know whether you're headed to heaven or hell. Let me tell you tonight, Jesus will save you if you'll just trust Him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that wonderful promise. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you noticed in the Bible the correlation and the pattern? The word shall is there every time salvation is mentioned. What is God trying to assure us? When you trust me for salvation, you're saved. When you trust me, you call out to me, and you do what I've asked you to do in calling out to me and crying out to me, I will save you. It's as easy as that. You know, it's, it's very interesting to me that the devil is called the deceiver. And the devil always, from the very first pages in the book of Genesis, what is the devil doing? He's making people doubt the Word of God. If Satan knows that he can undermine you and get you at your foundation, he knows if he can make you doubt your salvation, he can pretty much make you ineffective for the cause of Christ. Because I've noticed one thing about people who doubt their salvation. They're not out there doing anything. They're just, they're just not. They're not out there. They're not active for the Lord. Why? Because they don't feel that they're worthy. Let me None of us are worthy. But let me tell you this. When you trust Christ as your Savior, lock, stock, and barrel, let me tell you, you can take it to the bank and cash it in. God has promised you salvation if you've done what He's asked you to do. Shall be saved. I can trust in the Lord with my salvation salvation. Do you trust Him tonight? Do you trust Him like you did when you were a little kid when you gave your life to Christ? Do you trust Him as good today or even more than you did yesterday? The Bible tells us that we're not to walk away from trusting the Lord. We are to walk closer to trusting the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And that certainly implies our salvation. You say, preacher, I I've really needed this because I've doubted my salvation several times this week. Just believe God. Do we believe this book? Do we believe that if God says, I'll give you salvation, if you'll do this, that God will do it? Then if so, and that's what I, I've told people. We're talking about Satan, that deceiver. I said the only thing the devil's trying to do is rob you from the joy of being a Christian. The joy of your salvation. Don't let him have it. God's word says it and that settles it whether Satan believes it or not, right? Understand tonight. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior. I'm not talking about somebody who's living out in the world and says they've been saved and there's no fruit in their life. That's somebody who needs to get saved. I'm talking about some of you. I'm, I'm looking at some of y'all who, who you know exactly who I'm talking to. That you, you've got the fruit of being a Christian, but yet you keep allowing doubt to rob you from doing great things for God. Here's what you do. Devil, there it is. I'm going to take you back to a time I was eight years old. And I was sitting on the couch of my Aunt Jean's house. And she led me to the Lord and I received Christ that day. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What am I doing? That's what Jesus did. He just gave the devil the word of God. He said, here you go. Here's what my God says. 
And when that doubt serpent rises its head, here's what you do. Your serpent repellent right here in my hand. This is what God says. So I trust Him with my salvation. And then lastly tonight, I like this. We're to trust Him with our, in our times of affliction and trouble. We're to trust Him in the time of need. We're to trust Him with our salvation. But we're also needing to trust Him to bring us home. Trust Him to bring us home. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And God has promised us, if we're saved here tonight, He's promised us a home in heaven, has He not? He said in John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. He did tell us in John chapter 14, He said, if it were not so, I would not have told you. <laughs> what God's saying? I think maybe God realized that maybe sometimes we might even doubt our entrance into heaven. And God says, no, you don't doubt that. He says, let, let me tell you, heaven is for real. Let me tell you, there is a home up in heaven. And there's a place that I'm preparing for you. And if it were not so, I would not have told you. We can trust that God is preparing a home in heaven. Well, I tell you, I was thinking about people who are long gone. I was talking to Miss Phyllis yesterday. She dropped this flower here uh, in remembrance of Miss Maddie Ruth. And I think about Miss Maddie Ruth an awful lot. And I think about a lot of our folks we've lost over the last few years I've been here. And I thought, thought about, I could almost see her this morning sitting there right behind Miss Kay. And I think about what a godly woman she was and what a loving, caring woman she was and how she talked about before she left this world. She talked about going to heaven. Well, let me tell you, right now she is in the streets of gold. She is in heaven. She is in the presence of God. She has no more ailments. She has no more tears. She has no more pain. She has no more agony. I'm looking out in the crowd today. I think about people like Ray Bell. I think about people like Bruce Simpkins. I think about people who now are no longer walking the streets of agony and pain and now walking the streets of gold. Well, I praise God for that. And that's a guarantee. That is a promise, folks. I'm headed to heaven. I can trust God with my destiny. I can trust God that there's a home up in heaven. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm glad there is something better than this life. You know what the Bible tells us? If, if, if there wasn't a heaven, then we of, above all people are, are hopeless. Again tonight, we can trust God. There's a home that He is preparing for you and me. Think about it. Right now as I speak, He is preparing a home for us. Heaven's real. Heaven is not just something that's coming. It's a reality right now. Did you know the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 3 that we are citizens of heaven right now. We are pilgrims. Why are we pilgrims? In 1 Peter, he says we're strangers and pilgrims. Why? Because we belong to another city. A heavenly city. We're citizens of heaven right now. I can trust God about that place because God's already made me a citizen. And God's already promised, I'm, I'm making it. I'm building it. We think about folks that are long gone that are enjoying the pleasures of heaven. One day we will see them face to face as we will see Jesus face to face again. I'm watching some of your faces and I know you're thinking about loved ones that have gone on. Boy, I long to see them, but also, more importantly than that, long to see the face of Jesus. That's happening. It's going to happen. I can trust God. There's a place called heaven. Do you trust Him tonight? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He will direct thy paths. Simple Simply put, God's got everything in the palm of His hands. And what some of us need to do tonight is simply this. We need to take whatever's bothering us and whatever's defeating us, be it doubt of salvation, be it uh, financial, be it physical, be it spiritual, whatever it is, here's what you need to do. You need to come and take it by, hand, by the hand and you need to lay it on the altar and say, God, I give it to you. I trust you with this storm. I trust you with this and that. You know, I'm reminded, give you this illustration and we're done. 
I worked in construction with my dad for several years. And I, my dad did not have a fear of heights. We were doing beach houses. And we had these little big old 40 foot ladders that three men had to set up. And they put these little scaffoldings that were about this tall fall apart. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm up there against the wall with my little hammer and I'm going like this. And my dad's looking down. I can't hardly see my dad. My dad's an ant. Hammer that thing, boy! What are you, a woman? Hit that thing like a man. <laughs> I said, I'd rather, I said, maybe I'll get myself in trouble, but I'd rather be called a woman than, than to be dead. <laughs> you know, and I'll tell you, I never did get over my fear of heights. But I'll never forget, there were times we didn't use scaffolding and we just needed the ladder. And I remember climbing up there. My dad's about 270-some pounds at that time, so... Uh, he elected me the, the lighter of the two to crawl up there my little 100 pound some self I know you can't believe it but at one time I was half the man I am but I remember crawling up that ladder all the time and, and hammering that, that, that last final piece of siding and I'm, I'm going like this I'm just as scared to die I hate heights I'm all about rolling roller coasters but don't put me on a ladder I'm scared to death and I'm up there and and I'm, I'm hammering away. And I'll never forget, every time, Dad's at the bottom of the ladder, I got you. I got this. And Dad would say, I don't know why you're worried. If you fall, I'm going to get you. I'll never forget, there were times up there on the beach, and we were banging on the wall, and I'm getting the nail in there, and, the, and that ladder does this number like this. My dad, my dad's a tank, all right? Grab that thing. I seen my dad take those three man 40 ladder ladders and just pick it up himself. He's the man. But he take that ladder and he pop. I never had to worry about falling because my dad had the ladder. Never once did I fall. I do remember a time when I grabbed the ladder, Brother WC, and Daddy was at the top. And I don't know why he was at the top that particular day. But I was standing at the bottom. Bro, see, the, the, the math just doesn't add up. And that ladder did something funny. <laughs> and I'm holding for dear life. And I'm going, oh. And I, all I could think is, I don't want my dad to fall. I don't want my dad to get hurt. <laughs> and dad looked down at me. He said, let it go. <laughs> just let it go. <laughs> you can't do this. And I had to let it go and he fell. I thank God he didn't get hurt. But do you get the illustration? When Daddy held the ladder, all was well. But when Henry had the ladder, chaos. Some of us tonight need to give God our ladder. Some of us tonight need to let go and let God. Because when God's got it, it doesn't fall. With every head bowed and every